see everything the way it should be. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm sure um, folks will continue to join us um, as they are able to. Um, so this uh, is really just an information session for you folks. Uh, we are recording it just in case you want to share it with any team members who weren't able to make this particular time slot. Um, we're not going to share it publicly or anything like that, but I'll send out the link to you. So if you want to try to rope in some team members um, or some partners that you work with who might have a project to bring to the table, uh, you'll be able to, to share this information with them. So um, this is supposed to be a, a really casual information session. I'm going to go through some slides to give you a background on what we can expect um, and how to prepare for the course. Um, but it's also an opportunity for you folks to ask questions um, and really uh, dig into the information. So. Um, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science and the USDA Northern Forest Climate Hub are offering the Adaptation Planning and Practices Training as an online course for land managers. So it's a series of seven one-hour sessions and the focus of this course is on the forests, farms, and natural lands in Ohio. And what this is, is a unique opportunity that provides hands-on training in considering climate change information and identifying adaptation actions for natural resource management professionals working in forests and native ecosystems. So throughout the course, participants will receive coaching and feedback on their own real world climate adaptation project throughout the course. Um, so the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science has created this course to train natural resource professionals such as yourself and your instructors for this course will include myself, Patricia Leopold. I'm a climate adaptation specialist with NIACS. And Kristen Geisting, who recently completed her role as a liaison between NIACS and the Natural, Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, which she is currently employed by. Kristen and myself have taught versions of this course to larger geographies, focusing on forests, forested wetlands, um, and, and other ecosystem types. And Aaron Wilson is joining us as an instructor for this course because of his expertise in Ohio farms and forests as an OSU extension agent. And we're all really excited to work with you. Just a little bit of background about NIACS. We're an organization that's led by the Forest Service. We're funded by the Forest Service and we're primarily funded through three specific branches of the Forest Service, the Northern Research Station, the Eastern Region, and Northeastern Area State and Private Forestry. And that really enables us to work with um, not only the national forests, but all of their partners on the landscape. Our steering committee also includes indigenous industry and academic collaborators to address scientific and management needs in the fields of both climate and carbon management. And we strive to provide this practical information, resources, and technical assistance related to forests and climate change. Uh, and much of our work tends to center on helping natural resource managers make sense of climate change and incorporate climate change into their decision making processes. In the context of natural resource management, adaptation is the adjustment of systems in preparation or in response to climate change. So keep in mind that adaptation actions are designed to address risks while still meeting our management goals and objectives. Adaptation actions are designed to specifically address climate change impacts and vulnerabilities in order to meet goals and objectives. And adaptation often builds on sustainable management, conservation, restoration, and climate-informed actions may not always look new or wild or different. 
In fact, a changing climate may compel some managers to adopt new practices, but it can also underscore the importance of using those sustainable management practices that um, are currently being used. And the actions that we take now and will make uh, given climate change are heavily weighted by our values and our willingness to accept risk. So climate change adaptation, and unfortunately, there is no easy button either. So you might ask yourself, is adaptation when someone promotes a certain tree species? It could be. Does adaptation require assisted migration or abandonment of restoration goals? And the answer is maybe only when it makes sense. Or is adaptation thinking about climate change being compatible with existing planning? Absolutely and nearly always is the answer. Climate adaptation planning is not unrelated to current values, objectives, and constraints that drive our decisions and on the ground actions. They can often be very much the same. I'm sure you've all heard of climate change adaptation planning in one way or another. Um, so I know there's a lot of ideas and frameworks floating around out there describing what adaptation planning might look like. We know that climate change risks are becoming a bigger part of the forest management story, particularly when we describe a certain site and its risks. And so we think of adaptation planning as when land managers intentionally and explicitly consider climate change risk and adaptation in planning in order to help meet their management goals. In other words, developing distinct management actions that address climate change and can be written into a management plan. So if we think about how climate change affects our ability to manage a certain system, um, we can think about using a, a silviculture example here. Silviculture is driven by identifying objectives or desired future conditions and then developing prescriptions that over time will result in your desired future conditions. So if we take a minute to think about how we develop those desired future conditions, we usually base them on relationships that we've observed in the past. And we have a reasonable understanding of vegetation dynamics, crop rotation, um, the impact of disturbances, et cetera. And this facilitates the development of desired future conditions and then those prescriptive actions that you would implement. And we're using forests as an example here, but it's the same idea for agricultural systems. And then the impact of climate change on forests and farm systems is not so well understood. We don't have nearly as much experience with um, climate change as we do with traditional relationships. So climate change introduces this new level of uncertainty to those past relationships, and that will make it harder to achieve our desired future conditions. And it gets harder and harder um, as that time scale gets farther and farther out. And so the big question here is what actions can be taken to enhance the ability of a system to cope with change and meet management goals and objectives? And how can we as managers or practitioners develop plans for those actions in a systematic, organized way, despite all of the uncertainties of climate change in the foreseeable future and beyond? And so it really, um, it really depends. It depends on what you're starting out with and it depends on what you're trying to do. It depends on where you are 
And the where is very important because where you start out is going to be very different from where your neighbor starts out. You'll likely have different soils. You'll be at a different elevation. Um, you'll have a different exposure level. Um, and then, you know, you might have different threats or um, stressors or insect pests that you're dealing with. And it will also depend on what your goals are and what you're trying to achieve. For example, whether you have um, habitat goals, um, if you're managing wildlife species versus timber species. And so the solution really depends on your unique situation and that can get overwhelming fairly quickly. Uh, so to deal with um, all of the, the decision making that you have to do, we've developed the tools to help you identify unique solutions for your unique situation. Uh, we've developed a resource to help managers integrate climate change considerations into management decisions. Um, and the adaptation workbook is an adaptive management process and a decision support tool in the form of a workbook. And the workbook was designed to be flexible enough to accommodate your goals and your land ownership type. Um, and most often the, the workbook is used at a project level and centers on the manager's expertise and judgment. Um, we can help managers clarify and articulate how they've intentionally considered climate change adaptation in their management plans. But as a rule, the workbook doesn't make recommendations or provide the specific answers for managers to take credit for the good work that's already being done that is also addressing a climate change impact. And it creates an opportunity for managers to recognize that there are new approaches to dealing with climate change related threats and vulnerabilities. And so we call this resource the adaptation workbook because it's actually a workbook that people can put, you know, uh, pen to paper on, on worksheets. Um, you can find it in um, the general technical reports listed um, at the bottom of the screen here and also um, the online version that we'll be using throughout the course. And so what are the components of um, the adaptation workbook? Um, there's really no big mystery here. There's no black box. It's really just an adaptive management process for um, responding to climate change. So you may have seen this um, in a slightly different format as part of an adaptive management process. Um, and it's, it's not too different from something you've seen before. The workbook itself is simply a framework that steps people through a logical process um, with specific resources that we bring in um, to help you move stepwise through that process. Um, and it's the, the whole process is meant to simply provide a clear, transparent adaptation plan that connects the dots between what you're trying to do, how climate change impacts your ability to get that done, and then what you can incorporate as um, climate adaptation actions to make sure that you can get that done. So the workbook is a structured yet flexible, flexible process that's designed to help managers integrate climate change into natural resource planning. And it breaks the planning process down into bite-sized chunks that allows managers to step one, define what their management goals are and what kind of time frame they're working in assess um, in step two, what are the climate change impacts that are most relevant for their project location. And this is where we can bring in vulnerability assessments, such as the ones we've written for forest ecosystems or the national climate assessment. 
Um, and then in step three, we evaluate what those impacts mean in terms of being able to achieve your goals and whether those goals are still feasible, given what we know about climate change. And then in step four, using menus of adaptation strategies and approaches to identify what actions would make sense for helping to minimize those climate related risks. And then lastly, in step five, managers um, plan for how they can monitor to evaluate the effectiveness of their actions in meeting those management goals and objectives. And this is essentially the process that we will be using during the upcoming adaptation planning for Ohio farms and forests. Um, so this course is kind of the first of its kind in a way, because not only are we focusing on a specific geography, which is roughly central Ohio, but we're including both forestry and agriculture projects in the course. Um, so usually we just focus on, on forestry, forested ecosystems, um, urban forestry, things like that. So um, this is really an exciting opportunity um, to bring in agriculture um, projects. So both use the same five-step process, and they're really just unique in the, the resources and examples that are provided in order to help you complete the five steps. Um, so depending on uh, what your particular project focus is, you would choose either the, the um, adaptation workbook for forests or um, the one for agriculture. This is just showing the resources we bring in. And so in terms of the course objectives, um, what we're really striving for here is for you to end the course with a uh, real world climate adapted management plan. And so through this course, you'll be able to identify local climate change impacts, challenges, and opportunities. You'll be able to develop specific actions for adapting to your specific changing conditions. Um, you'll create your own climate-informed project using a project that you bring to the table. Um, we'll include a communication segment so that you're better able to talk about climate change with your stakeholders and partners on the landscape. Um, and then after the course, um, your instructors are still going to be around. Um, we're going to, to stick around and make sure that you get the help you need finishing up your, your project or um, creating communication resources um, or finding uh, resource specialists to help you begin to implement some of these activities. So we'll be with you um, even after the course is over. And so um, just to set up some expectations for the course up front, um, hopefully uh, you, this isn't anything new to anybody, but we expect you to attend seven lectures and um, discussion sessions. So each lecture and discussion class will occur weekly on Tuesday. We'll have about 30 minutes um, of lecture and 30 minutes of discussion. Uh, note that we will have one week off during the week of March 16th, um, and so you can use that time to catch up um, or check in with one of the instructors uh, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about your project. Um, and so we'll um, make sure that all of this information gets into your hands prior to the course. Um, uh, through a course syllabus, which is really close to being finalized. Um, so we'll get that out to you. Uh, we do expect that the first lecture might take a little bit longer. So we might have more lecture and less discussion time since we have a little bit more introductory information to cover. Um, but typically after class, we'll stick around um, to answer any questions that you might 
have. On a normal week, discussion sessions might occur immediately following the lecture and consist of things like interactive activities to help drive home points or further explore a topic. Um, and it will rely heavily on group discussion um, and live support sessions. So it's a really, it's meant to, to allow you to have some time to really interact with others in the class um, and interact with um, your instructors. And then in addition to the live sessions, um, outside assignments will uh, be expected to, to guide you through the new material and the corresponding sections of the adaptation workbook. So after the, the lecture, we'll expect you to jump online and complete um, each step of the adaptation workbook. Um, you'll be able to access supplementary videos, uh, links to additional resources, and um, we'll provide some opportunities for reflection and commentary through um, some homework assignments. Um, so these assignments um, and the work that it takes to complete the adaptation workbook generally take two to four hours per week to complete. So uh, you can do that on your own or you can work with a team um, to talk about uh, what goes in each step of the adaptation workbook. And um, we were approved for 20 category one um, continuing education credits through the Society of American Foresters. If there is um, another agriculture equivalent um, to those continuing education credits, let me know and I'm happy to apply for those as well. Or if there's um, another certification system that you're working with, um, we can check into that as well. So don't hesitate to, to reach out. So um, in terms of the course format, um, we're, we're going to follow the five steps of the adaptation workbook. Um, and uh, we'll cover an example of that uh, in just a few slides. The course is designed to include that project work time to complete a single step of the adaptation workbook, um, followed by that group discussion and lecture to review your last step and get you set up for the next step. Um, and so everyone should attend that weekly lecture. If you can't attend a particular week, um, you know, the course isn't off the table for you. We will record each of the sessions and make those videos available to you um, through our YouTube channel. And we'll also provide you with the presentation slides. So we do hope that one session is all you'll have to miss throughout the course. Otherwise, it could be a little difficult to catch up, but you do have um, a little bit of flexibility built in. Um, and so the, the big question <laughs> that you might be asking is what will you work on in this course? Um, so this training is, is really designed for any natural resources professionals working in forests, agriculture, um, and other ecosystem types. And so um, you, you might be a forester, you might be um, a farm manager, you might be a consultant uh, working on public, tribal, or, or private lands. Uh, you might be a professional providing extension or service forestry or other technical assistance to foresters, um, or you might just be a woodland owner. All are encouraged to participate. The course is designed to accommodate a motivated individual, but you can also bring in a group of your colleagues. Um, so for example, uh, if you're the forester on a project and you're working with a biologist and a botanist, um, that would be a great example team to uh, make sure you have a well-rounded adaptation plan. We realize that 
you know, ideally that that would that works great, but not everybody has access to their colleagues. And so uh, working individually is just fine as well. If you are considering a small group, um, we should have a conversation offline with you about how to uh, pull this off using one account on the Adaptation Workbook website. So we'll want to get you a password that works for everybody in your team, and then you'll figure out um, how to work on that together. So let me know um, if you're thinking about that option. During the course, um, you'll develop your own climate-informed adaptation project plan or proposal or, you know, however you want to frame that. Um, so in order to do that, you'll need to identify a place to focus your thoughts and help set the context. So ideally, you're coming to the course with a project that you're very familiar with, um, a project that can be thought of at the site level, um, and a, it's a project that has clear goals and objectives. Um, so hopefully you can hit all of those targets um, and you have a place in mind that you know very well and you know what it is you're trying to do there. Um, that's essentially what step one of the adaptation workbook is. So if we can get that uh, done before you start the course, you'll be in a really good place to finish the, four, the other four steps of the adaptation workbook. Um, but without having a clear place in mind with clear goals and objectives, um, you'll find it really difficult to then assess what are the climate change impacts that affect those goals and objectives. Um, so in terms of choosing a project, remember that this course is designed to teach you how to integrate climate change into your plans. So don't overcomplicate the process with a complex project. <laughs> so uh, start looking at projects that you're already working on, um, that you're already familiar with. If it is a big project, um, you might want to prioritize or, or focus on a portion of a larger complex project. We ask that participants bring a real world project of your very own um, because it's a great way to get the most from this course. Uh, you're working on a project that's close to home and you're identifying solutions that are close to home. Um, so during the course, we'll help you consider climate change and how it could affect your project area and your management. That's where our expertise comes in. Um, and you will do most of the heavy lifting on identifying what adaptation options um, will work best for you. We'll provide uh, the adaptation menus that give you some great ideas. And then it's your job to really refine what those look like so that um, at the end of the day, when you're ready to present this adapted management plan to your colleagues, you'll have something that's custom built and um, ready to implement. And it's really important that you pick a project that isn't so big that it's overwhelming um, and not so small that um, you're done in 10 minutes and, and have nothing else to say. So it's a balance to find a project that is the right fit for this course. It goes by quickly, um, and so a big project uh, isn't probably going to get the face time it deserves. Um, and so that sweet spot is finding a project that is conceptually um, not too simple, but is, is manageable. Um, it's really kind of a sliding scale. So from past courses that we've taught, we've found that projects on the scale of maybe 20 acres to a few hundred acres work really well. 
um, and examples of those types of projects might include a forest stewardship plan for a private woodlot, a farm, a field, or a group of um, pasture, cropland, and um, forest uh, systems on one particular property. Um, it could be a management plan for a few forest stands or compartments. It could be a timber sale. Um, it could be one forest type. So you have your elm ash cottonwood forest type in, in a riparian area, for example, that you want to focus on. Or it could be an issue that is housed within an area or ownership. So for example, you might want to think about how you'd respond to an outbreak of uh, emerald ash borer or hemlock woolly adelgid or another pest on um, multiple acres um, and forest types across your property. So you could focus on, on just one issue um, instead of one particular forest type or crop type. And another example might be to focus on creating or improving a particular type of wildlife habitat within a larger landscape or ownership. So you might look at something like early successional habitat or habitat for a particular species across a larger scale. And so the trick is really to find that balance where you have one or a few ecosystem types and a handful of objectives for um, each, each forest type. So a few forest types and just a few objectives for each of those forest types, for example. Um, and so your project can cover a larger area if that area is um, fairly homogenous and not too complex. You might think about, you know, a bigger property type if you're really just looking at one forest type. Um, but if you have a really complex ecosystem or issue, you might want to prioritize um, one part of that that you could really focus on for the adaptation um, course. So you focus on that smaller component of your land base. You go through the adaptation workbook with that simpler component. And then after the course, now that you have an idea of how it works and you have access to the adaptation workbook online, you can always go back and work on those additional components of your property. Your adaptation workbook also isn't going to go away after the course is over. You can continue to build on that. Um, you can export it, share it with colleagues, um, and continue working on it. We can use the same workbook process projects with the Forest Service looking at 40 to 100,000 acres, and we've even modified it to look at the entire natural resources program for the Pennsylvania GCNR, but those projects are just too big and complex. So um, in this group, based on your responses to our registration questions, I've noticed that some of you are looking at forested ecosystems and agriculture. So you'll want to make a decision for this course to use either the forest adaptation resources or the adaptation resources for agriculture as your primary workbook. So think about um, which workbook best represents your priority for your project area. Um, and then you can um, still wrap in components of the other using um, the other um, workbook, but you'll, you'll want to know which one you're going to focus on for this course. And we're always here to help Aaron and Kristen and I, if you're struggling with the scale of a desired project or you wanna check in with us, um, that's why we're asking you to 
fill out the step one of the adaptation workbook before the course and email that to us so we can make sure that uh, you're not biting off more than we think you can chew um, and you're getting at the right level of detail for your management goals and objectives. So speaking of which, uh, defining management goals and objectives. After you've chosen your project, we ask that you spend some time clearly articulating what those goals and objectives are um, and spend some time describing the overall intention of the management on this property and what it looks like. So when we talk about management goals, we're talking about the big picture here that really sets the context for what we're trying to do on this site. So management goals are broad general statements. They're usually not quantifiable and they express a desired state or a process to be achieved. Objectives are more specific and they tier to each of those goals and they help explain how we are going to achieve our stated goals. Um, so I know a lot of you already know this, um, but often we see the objectives and goals are defined in the opposite way. And so for this course, that's why we really clearly define what our goals are, those big picture items and then our more specific objectives. So if you already have a management plan with goals and objectives, then you're all set. All we have to do is copy and paste those goals and objectives into the adaptation workbook um, or maybe refine that list to a manageable set for this course. So again, look to your stewardship plan or your, your farm plan documents um, and don't try to recreate create the wheel on this, but simply uh, identify what it is um, that your plan is setting out to do. Um, it's, it's that easy, step one is that easy. So some examples here, um, for example, a big broad goal might be to increase stream connectivity along the Lazy River. And so a way to do that is to remove three of the structures that impede the natural flows or, or barriers to aquatic ecosystems over the next 15 years. So you can see how the, the goal and the objective are really um, working together. And lastly, as you're working on your step one, this course, this whole course is designed to be a climate change filter. So what we want for you to be able to do in this course is to think about all of your business as usual management goals and objectives, and then think about climate and how climate might affect your plans. We actively discourage you from putting down goals that are aimed at creating a resilient forest or creating an adapted management plan because that's what all of your goals and objectives should be doing by completing this course. So hopefully that makes sense. Talk to me um, if, if it doesn't. So if you in step one can really look at your project and provide the objectives that are tied to the ecosystem services or benefits that you want to see like timber production, uh, firewood production, and forest cover, habitat quality, et cetera, then this course will evaluate all of those objectives will be a climate adaptation plan that includes specific details for all of your objectives. The tool is a filter or a gut check um, on our planning. Uh, and in the end, the workbook, process is used to really make sure that our goals and objectives are robust and resilient to all the climate change related risks and, and vulnerabilities. So um, here's some things that are good to keep 
in mind um, is you think about your project and what you're trying to do here. Uh, make the most of this course and try to use a project that you're already working on or you are just about to start working on. Choose a project that already has defined goals and objectives and if it doesn't you can use something like mylandplan.org to help you identify those goals and objectives uh, remember that your goals and objectives Looks like we lost Patricia. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Chris. Okay, great. Yes. So let's see if I can do this. Anywhere on this slide. All right, can you guys see my screen? We cannot. Okay. Hopefully Patricia will, oh, it looks like she is back on. Patricia, are you back on? I was just getting ready to share my screen. Hey there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I will go ahead and try to uh, reshare my screen and try this again. And then Kristen, if I get knocked off on, on knocked offline again, just go ahead and take over for me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Here we go again. Okay, can you guys see my full slide again? Patricia, you're pretty choppy still. It might help if we turn the camera off. Okay, so I believe I left off on the things to keep in That's a great idea. Okay, did that improve my audio? It seems like it did, yep. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yes, yes. we can hear you and it's um, the purpose of the course is to be intentional. Okay, so you can hear me okay. Yes, yep, you're good to go. Okay, so the per of the 
Okay, we're back on track. This, um, this might seem like a lot of work for free course. Uh, so you might be wondering why take all this time to create an adaptation plan. Uh, it can feel. All right, let's see if I can take over and get this finished. Okay. So I'm going to try to share the PowerPoint from my screen now. All right, you should be seeing hopefully my desktop and now I will share the slides from where Patricia left off. Oh, are you guys seeing the PowerPoint? Yes, we're, yes, we can now. Okay. All right, so I think this is where Patricia was hopefully at. Um, so she was saying this might seem like a lot of work for a free course. Why should we take the time to create an adaptation plan? So it may feel like an extra step, but it's important and critical to the long-term effectiveness of our actions. It's always been impossible for us to predict the future and climate change makes that uncertainty even more apparent. Um, so when we practice adaptive management, we're learning how to adjust and manage in the face of uncertain future conditions, uh, but the workbook will help us to be clear and intentional in telling our story um, and how we're going to connect our actions to climate risks. And being able to tell our story will help us to communicate with our colleagues, partners, stakeholders, grant providers, and technical service providers. Um, many climate-informed actions are also supported by things like NRCS equip practices, state best management practices, and sustainable forestry practices. So throughout the course, we will be helping to make those connections where possible. Um, and this is just an example a case study of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So they, their goals were to convert 85 acres of degraded field into mature forests to do things like reconnect and enlarge forest blocks and do some selective thinning and underplanting while also in minimizing invasive species. Um, so this is just an example of some of the work that we have kind of assisted with through this adaptation workbook process. Um, and we also have many other demonstration projects. Um, actually, we have 350 projects so far and the projects that you'll be developing through this course will add to that number even further. Um, so these demos provide real world examples of climate change adaptation. Each one of these is a different example of what climate change can look like on the ground um, and what those adaptation responses can be. So it's good to think about the wide variety of responses because every management project will look different based on the goals and objectives for that project area. So these are just sort of like real world stories um, and you can check those out at forestadaptation.org backslash demos if you're interested in seeing um, some of the work that has already been done using the adaptation workbook. So hopefully, I think everybody here has already registered for the course, um, but if not, there's a link that you can follow to do that. Um, and then the next step for everybody who has registered is to complete the step ones those will be emailed to Patricia. You can see her email there. Um, and then you can start exploring the adaptation workbook um, at that link, adaptationworkbook.org. I think that is all that we had prepared. So if there are any questions, I can take those, or Patricia maybe is back on. Hi there, I am back on. I'm not gonna dare to turn my video back on. Thank you for um, taking over, Kristen. Sure. And I'm sorry that took a little bit longer than we promised, um, but I will finish um, uh, completing the syllabus um, next week and I will send that out with a copy of the uh, Word versions of the adaptation workbook. So you can fill out that step one and you can send it back to me um, 
And yeah, with that, I'll open it up for any questions or discussion. I'll ask a question. This is Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Hi, thanks for the information today. It was really helpful. Um, I had was struggling to come up with some really good ideas, and now I have too many ideas, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, in your um, experience, is it easier to come up with a location first, um, or is it easier to come up with um, an idea? that could be applied to a location? Like if you wanted to, like you mentioned addressing a resource concern or something like that. What, where do you tend to see more success in projects? Um, in all honesty, I think uh, most of our adaptation demonstrations um, that are online have started with a place. Uh, as you go through the workbook, it's um, it's really important to, to know your place really well because when you think about the climate change impacts that are affecting that place, then you can identify, you know, how does uh, increases in temperature really affect the soils or the hydrology of that site? And then those things are often very much tied to your management goals and objectives. Um, so if you pick a place that you're familiar with, um, usually you can fairly easily identify what are those management goals and objectives for that particular place. Um, and so that's a, what a lot of our projects have done. Um, but we have many examples too of having picked a topic like invasive species management or spruce grouse habitat um, and it, you know, across many acres and different forest types, it's an issue that they're really focused on. And so that has worked out just as well as, you know, picking a place first. And so as you think about narrowing down your ideas, I would recommend, um, again, really thinking about what are your opportunities for carrying that project through from planning to implementation, um, choosing maybe one that is most accessible, um, physically accessible, choose one that is most actionable, um, choose one that is most timely um, or, you know, use another filter that works really well for your, for your organization. Is that helpful? It is, yes. And Jessica, you, you are thinking about an agriculture project, is that right? Yes, I'd like to try an ag project. Okay, um, that's great. Yeah, so um, if you uh, spend some time thinking about what your answer to those questions might be, <laughs> and then if you want to um, talk with uh, Aaron and Kristen and I, um, or just one of us, depending on who's available, uh, we're happy to help you frame that project even further and, and really pick a good project for the course. So we can talk offline about that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Jessica, I know we work in other spheres as well, um, tangentially related. So anytime you want to talk about it, you know, just let me know. I'd okay. be happy to just you know, brainstorm or, or think about things. And, and I'm sure I would learn quite a bit as well, so. Yeah, your, your uh, mention of um, the idea of risk, that's a big deal with farmers and the ag community yeah. and, and, and flooding is a big risk factor. Um, yeah. And so I was, for an idea, it was, okay, could, could I focus on that as an idea versus um, a very specific field with a very specific plan? Um, right. That's what I was thinking when I asked the question. 
Okay. Okay, I see. I see where you're going, and in that case, it would be like definitely pick a geography that you want to focus on, and then within that geography, you're still going to want to identify, um, you know, what is it you're trying to do with that land, and so you know whether it's crop field or pasture or livestock, like we, we're going to want to know what the land use is. And then um, in terms of climate change impacts, we can really look at the flood risk to those things. Okay, okay. I see. But what you're going to want to identify what it is we're comparing the risk to. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, how would you uh, categorize an agroforestry op uh, based project where somebody's wanting to do, say, like silvopasture, developing uh, a method of running livestock through a woodland or creating a woodland in an existing pasture or creating, I guess it'd be more of a savanna ecosystem um, or something like forest farming where you're wanting to develop a, uh, say, a, a ramps uh, production in a, in a woodlot that you have? Would you classify that as forestry or as agriculture? So, um, and Kristen can chime in here, but it sounded like the first example might be more agriculture focused and work better with the agriculture workbook, whereas the second example might be uh, better with the forest adaptation resources. And so if we're just thinking about the actual site and what that looks like, if it's more on the ag side of things, you're going to want to choose the agriculture workbook just because when you go um, to use the resources that are, are really helping out that workbook, it's going to be impacts that are more agriculture focused and it's going to be um, adaptation strategies that are going to work better in those ag systems. And then on the other hand, you know, if you're really looking at a forest system and what you can do there um, in terms of ramps production or other non-timbered forest products, it's really going to work better with the forest adaptation resources and their set of men their menu of adaptation strategies and approaches. Okay, thank if you're you. Trying, if you're trying to do both and you really want to do both, I would say still pick one or the other. And then we'll show you how to bring in those other adaptation menus. Um, we have a website that, you know, basically you can just go download the other adaptation menu and bring that in to think about your other system. So it is possible. You'll just want to pick a primary one and then we can go to the other one to bring in those resources. Great questions.